are minimalists. <laughs> How should I go about combating roommates or friends of roommates who steal my material items, such as food or money or self-care? So, Chris, let's let's rephrase Gwen's question here. Basically, say, how do I appropriately set boundaries with the people in my community or in my home or whatever to ensure those boundaries are not crossed? Mm. You want to prevent people from from stealing, obviously, property damage, but also just tense living situations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, you live in a, can you talk a bit about your, maybe your communal situation? So we've experimented with a number of different configurations over the past year, ranging from like a time segmented type arrangement where for a few days a week, we're living with another family. So I've got two kids, uh, one who's a girl who's seven and a boy who's three. And we've spent time living under the same roof with another couple who have kids of similar ages. Mm-hmm. And How so many we, kids do they have? Uh, so we've lived with a, a number of different families, but I think they've all had two kids now, of about the same ages. Now, what have you learned from living with these different families? Because you, uh, Gwen's question here is, you, you basically have introduced roommates. What, what yeah. we in, in our today's society would say roommates, it's different from that. But that's how you even have to classify it. it it's almost, it's, it's, it's euphemistic, right? There was a time not too long ago when gay couples used to have to say they had roommates mm. a, a, as opposed to having uh, a partner or a husband. Or, a, and, and so now you are uh, trying these sort of experiments uh, with other families living together. Um, how did you, why did you start doing this? <laughs> Uh, I think the kids were actually the main driver. Um, I did a podcast interview with Peter Gray, who you may, might, might know. His, uh, he's got a really great book called Free to Learn. Okay. Mm-hmm. And Peter talked about the common word is unschooling. Yes. Mm-hmm. I don't really like that term. Peter doesn't like it either because it focuses on what you're not doing mm-hmm. versus what you are doing. Yeah. So perhaps a better description is non-coercive, self-directed learning, meaning you're trusting the kids to find the best learning opportunity on their own without you doing much of anything. Mm -hmm. And in order for that to work, you need older kids, right? I don't care how old your kid is, you need an older kid because the older kid is like the scaffolding that helps the younger kid up to the next level. So you're not doing the teaching, the older kids are doing the teaching. Mm. You know, so I've, I've seen this happen firsthand where you've got an older kid that can read and they're looking at words on a screen or a piece of paper and they're telling the younger kid what they say. So the older kid is actually teaching the younger kid, even though the older kid doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah, and, and in that teaching, well, he or she is also learning through the, pro- I mean, you learn so much more by teaching than, than yeah. just about any other uh, way. Exactly, mm-hmm. and so the problem is that like, you can't do that with just two kids, right? Like you need more kids than that. And so the question then becomes, well, where do you get more kids? Now we live in a very rural area where most of the houses are on very large lots. Mm -hmm. And so there are some kids around in the neighborhood, but not enough. And so we needed to do something to bring more kids in. Mm -hmm. And and, and that's exactly what we've been able to do. And it's been great. Well, let's talk a bit bit more about that. Um, When you say it's been great, it sounds like you've lived with several different families. Uh Explain that. Yeah, so we've done a couple of different things. We've had people living in our house. So we live in quite a small house, it's about 1200 square foot and uh, you know that's not very much space when you've got two families living under the same roof we've also done other things like having people bring on a trailer like these trade I don't know if you've seen them but these travel trailers are tremendous value for money you can get like a house that's nicer than our house (laughs) for you know twenty thousand dollars or something and you can move it you can just roll it on to so we're lucky that we live on quite a large property Mm -hmm. we've had people bring on a trailer and use that as a sort of separate space uh, from the main house that can definitely get a little bit crazy at times. Mm. And and so how do you navigate these relationships? Because these d- different people have different desires, different wants, yeah. different preferences, different hobbies, uh, different levels of tolerance and, and different desires. Uh, how do you navigate all of that? Well, I think you start by having similar value systems, right? So mm-hmm. ancestral health is super important to us mm-hmm. and it gives us some guiding principles that we operate by and like finding people that share those values. Like I could live with you, it'd be great because yeah. I know you eat the same food, you go to bed at the same time. Mm-hmm. I think we could, we share a lot of things in common. And so it's not that much work to try and close the gap, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, 
Some, I heard once uh, a lawyer told me that, that sometimes a case will go to mediation and the judge will just refuse to do anything. They won't try and close the gap because it's just too big. Yeah. Like there's too much distance between the two sides mm -hmm. and they say, go away, just go sue yourself, mm. you know, go sue each other because this is not a gap I can close. And I think the same is true with like communal living. Like you need to find people that share your value system so that whenever conflict does arise, there's like not that much of a gap to close. And so, and that is indeed what we've been doing. So all of the people we've lived with have had very similar value systems. Mm. Ryan, it sounds like you, <coughs> obviously the, the thing that, um, the best way to deal with conflict within the house to get back to, to Gwen's question here is to screen the roommates beforehand, yeah, right? Right. I think back to relationships that I've had, whether friendship or inti intimate relationships, mm -hmm. Quite often, it's simply a screening problem because as Chris said, like, we don't have the same values. Of course, there's good, with that greater gap means there's going to be greater tension between the two of us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to Gwen's question, I would, you know, ask her, is there a way to close that gap with, with her roommates and with her roommates' friends, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, if it's not possible, I mean, she could certainly do things like, I don't know, when I had roommates, I would lock my door. Um, I'd didn't it didn't get to the point where i had a where i had to get like my own mini fridge because uh that gap with the particular roommate you know who i'm talking about oh yeah um i will uh not name him to not shame him <laughs> publicly we'll on for patreon yeah exactly but you know if i couldn't move out and if i couldn't afford it to have moved out like it would have come to that situation where i would have had to spend like a couple hundred bucks to get my own mini fridge Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, if the gap is too large, Gwen, she's got to move out. <laughs> it's really rough. It's yeah. very different from my situation. Like everyone yeah. we've lived with has, has been tremendously respectful, like overly cautious of right. anything. You know what it's like when you move in with a partner and, it, and it, it's kind of intimidating, right? Like you're moving yeah. into their space mm -hmm. and you tread really lightly and mm -hmm. you're just very respectful. Yeah. That's more similar to my situation yeah. versus living in college with a bunch of arsehole roommates that are like fine about taking your food and yeah. all, like that's a very different situation i think totally. but even then you have you have conflict right and, and so there'll be times where maybe you don't agree on a parenting thing yeah. and, and, and how does that work out uh that actually ended one uh one yeah you're right like here we go now yeah. we're getting into <laughs> the drama <laughs> the juicy stuff yeah i thought so i don't have a parenting style um, that's actually Peter Gray talked about that on my podcast as well. Mm -hmm. Like hunter gatherers don't do parenting and they don't do teaching either. Mm. And uh, you know I've read some really good books on this. Alison Gopnik, The Carpenter and the Gardener, is a, a really good one. And I love that metaphor. It's like so relevant for dealing with complex systems. You know, where in carpentry you measure twice and you cut once, and it's like building a dining room table, and it's very obvious when the job is done. And mm -hmm. you know you test to see if it wobbles and all this stuff, and then maybe you make some you know, slight refinements. And in the end, you've got this perfectly crafted piece of furniture. Whereas in gardening, it's mostly about keeping the weeds out and, mm. and just creating a, of an environment for, mm. the, for the plants to flourish. And you never really know what you're going to get, you know? I mean, of course, you know what seeds you put in the ground, but you don't really know what's going to grow. Right. And so what Alison Gopnik is arguing is that parenting is more like gardening and less like carpentry. Uh. Mm. But a lot of people, they treat it like carpentry. And, uh -huh. and that, in the beginning, I thought, I don't care, you know? It's fine if, like, if you want to do helicopter parenting, go ahead and helicopter. But and, you know, I, I don't have a style, so I should be compatible with any style. But you're right. It like once they start helicoptering your kids, mm -hmm. it's like, oh shit! Like I can't oh, handle oh, this. Oh. And so that actually yeah. did end one relationship. So oh, give me Lord. examples of of helicoptering. What, what does that look like in in the real world? Uh, I mean, it looks exactly what it sounds like. It, <laughs> it's you 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 like, you're literally hovering over the child, mm -hmm. micromanaging their every move. And the way it would, like, I know it was happening, is, even if I'm not paying attention, is like I would hear the kid's name over and over again, like over and over again. You're like, wait, why is, why is the person using the kid's name over and over again? Mm -hmm. It's because they're constantly trying to direct them towards control. the next. It's control, yeah. yeah it's overly yeah. controlling. Now, mm. now what, what about that control is so appealing to us? I don't know. It's like I think... One thing I think is going on in Silicon Valley is people are really struggling with purpose. You know, they do, mm. you know, like there's this kind of standing joke that the, the brightest minds in the world are all working in Silicon Valley, getting people to click on stuff, right? right. Like, yeah. <laughs> like oh, all these wow. people with PhDs and you know, stuff like just getting people to click on stuff. Mm. And, and it's, it's, not, it, it's not really scratching people's itch. You know, it's not like a, a great purpose. And mm -hmm. I think it's a really common thing for 
people to either quit their job or um, you know, this is what they do as a hobby. Like they go all in on parenting, you know, like. Yes. <laughs> it becomes a new obsession. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I think a lot of the helicopter parenting too probably spawns from good intentions, you know, like maybe oh, you, yeah. you're just trying to protect your kid from not getting hurt. Um, and there is a, there's a balance there, right? But yeah, if you're constantly hovering over them, you're not allowing them to flourish themselves. Yeah, and exactly, themselves. exactly. Good intentions and bad ideas. Jonathan mm -hmm. Haidt's book, The Coddling of the American Mind, explains mm -hmm. the whole thing very mm -hmm. well, I think. Yeah, and I think if we, we back up and, and re remove ourselves from even the parenting situation, the same thing can happen with roommates or, or significant others, spouses, whatever. Mm -hmm. We can become helicopter partners. <laughs> we can become you know, helicopter roommates and, and it quickly becomes an untenable situation. And so it's fascinating to me when we're talking about communal living, Really what you're talking about isn't a traditional commune necessarily, mm. but it's maybe an iteration of that. What do you mean by commune? Well, what, what, do you, what, what, Im what images does that conjure when I say commune? Uh, it conjures up images, wild, wild country. That was actually, I, yeah. I lied, I said I don't watch TV. We yeah. did watch that on Netflix, <laughs> it was really good. I really enjoyed that. So yeah, I think of gurus, uh -huh. like it scares yeah. the hell out of me, you know, like yeah. somebody, a boss, like, no. But right. it sounds to me like often those intentions of, cause here's the thing, we, we hear about wild, wild country or we hear about Nexium or, or whatever, these, these cults, right? Mm. And there are so many that you don't hear about because they're actually just communes that are working fine and there isn't some sex crazed leader who is making the news. It just happens to be that they're fine. We hear about the salacious stuff, right? Mm. And so we hear about when people are drinking Kool-Aid and killing themselves and, or, or joining some sort of cult that castrates e each other, whatever it is. That stuff makes the news. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't make the news. Four families decide to live together happily. Right. Exactly. <laughs> lived happily ever after. It's not a great news story, is it? No. And so, um, do, I don't know, do you see this evolving over time as you get acclimated with different families or whatever? Do you see a, a larger group forming out of this potentially? Well, that's an interesting question, is it? How much is enough mm. is, uh, is a very interesting question. Yeah, I, we've yet to figure out what the ideal number is. So I know that things get way better and my motivation to go find the others goes exponentially down as we add more people. Yeah. So even oh. one other couple and their kids is so much better than just the nuclear family in my opinion. Uh -huh. How many uh, families are living on your property right now? So at the moment, so we were in a relationship with another couple that's going really well and they've got two kids who are 11 and just turned seven. And then we've got another neighbor who has a four year old girl who recently put a trailer on our property. And, cool. and she's more like sort of the time segmented thing, you know, where she'll come for a couple of days a week. Cool. And that's, I mean, so far so good. That's like it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's really new, but so yeah. far so good. Awesome. I want to talk about your sleeping situation on the Maximal episode, but we have, uh, we have some more to get into. Gwen, I'm going to send you a copy of the Minimalist Rulebook. Because one thing we didn't talk about, but it should be self-evident at this point, is boundaries. Mm. Now, the first boundary is before you even let the roommate into the house, right? Uh, and, until you, the first boundary is not coming to an agreement with someone who has complete opposite values with you. You know you're setting yourself up for discontent, for quote-unquote failure, for tension, et cetera, uh, property damage, whatever. Like there, there's going to be all kinds of, of things you don't want to get involved in. But even mm -hmm. then, like Ryan and I have the same values. We don't always agree on things. In fact, he and I have lived together before. We've had different preferences. And sometimes that just dictates, you know, I think what, what really helped Ryan and I live together was kind of what Chris was saying is like we, we didn't just tolerate each other. We respected each other's desires. Yes. And in that respect, even if I don't completely understand it, I can completely appreciate mm -hmm. you know, the way that you live and vice versa. As long yeah. as you're not harming me or anyone else. Yeah, and we were totally capable of telling each other if something was bugging us or something, that our, our preferences were being stepped on maybe. Yeah. It was very simple to just have a conversation. And I mean, that might just spawn from, I think we have an exceptional, an exceptional relationship in that sense where like we can deliver the truth to each other in a way even if it sounds negative, like we don't take it negatively, we just kind of take it for what it is. Yes. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's a, unfortunately a rare thing in relationships, but I think the closer people can get to that in their relationships to not be offended when someone's like, hey, I'd really appreciate it if you X, Y, or Z. Um, yeah, that would create some better living situations for sure. Yeah, I found five words that are really useful for me as well. 
Um, would you be willing to? <laughs> would right? you be willing to shut up? <laughs> 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 but I- instead of like, hey man, how come you always leave your uh, salt crumbs on the counter? Yeah. Hey, would you be willing to clean those up? Yeah. And it just it this not a patronizing way, but hey, you know, would you be willing to? And and those have disarmed so many arguments mm-hmm. in, in my life, but also shows a just a, a common respect. And I think another way to show respect is to set boundaries up. So we have the minimalist rule book. It's sixteen rules for living with less you can download it for free over at the minimalists.com slash rule book also the audiobook version is available there as well or you can get the free ebook there just download it the minimalists.com slash rule book